The views and opinions expressed are those of the individual and are not the reflections of any Grand Masonic body. The goal in this video series is to enlighten the minds of our viewers with Masonic education for the modern Freemason, wherever they may be. Take due notice thereof and govern yourselves accordingly. This is Modern Working Tools, today's tools for the modern Freemason. And here is your host, Brother Justice. Hello, I am companion Brother Justice Fisher uh, from Fox River Chapter Number 14 in Geneva, Illinois. And I have a very distinguished guest, companion Brother Christopher Earnshaw. He is here going to give a little presentation about the Royal Arch and uh, some of the symbolism involved with that and uh, a very great presentation here. Uh, so yes, Brother Chris, I'm just gonna give you the floor and just let you go. And uh, thank you so much for coming on. It's an honor to have you back, Brother. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, if everyone's ready, I'd like to just start by uh, giving a little bit of background to the Royal Arch because it's quite complicated and um, so let me start with the letters after a lodge's name, AF and AM. As you know, this stands for Ancient, Free and Accepted Masons. So in other words, in early days of Freemasonry, there were actually three different classes of Masons. In those days, labor uh, was very organized. Uh, guilds had set geographical areas in which to sell their wares and the prices were decided by the local authorities. However, the building trades, on the other hand, were recognized as fraternities rather than guilds because they had to travel to new building sites. They are what we now refer to as operative masons. Besides these operative masons, there were also accepted masons, people who were not blue collar workers, but joined a lodge either for the fellowship or to be near to the people that they employed. So in 1716, three accepted masons decided to make a change to the unstructured organization of the stonemasons lodges. These three men were Anthony Sayer, a lawyer, George Payne, a director of the Exchequer, or as you say in the US, the, the Treasury, and John de Saguliet, who was secretary to Sir Isaac Newton at the Royal Society. These three men were to become the first three Grand Masters of the Premier Grand Lodge of England. <clears throat> and at the same time, they were also the last three Grand Masters who were gentry, because from 1720 onwards, all the Grand Masters were either aristocrats or nobility. The first three Grand Masters had joined operative lodges as accepted masons and they decided to establish a grand lodge in London, what they called the metropolis. This is important because they had no intention for Freemasonry to become an international charity that it is today. So when the grand, premier grand lodge was started in 1717, and by the way, it wasn't called the Grand Lodge of England for at least another 20 years. So in 1717, many of the existing operative lodges were not included in the Grand Lodge and these were known as St. John's Lodges. So besides this operative background to Freemasonry, there is one more point and that is the effect of the law of England 
on the craft. In 1534, King Henry VIII uh, split with Rome to establish the Church of England. And from this date onwards, England became a Protestant nation. Following this, in 1599, uh, Queen Elizabeth introduced the Act of Uniformity, which was renewed in 1662. This was to strengthen Anglicanism in uh, England, and at the same time, Catholics no longer became welcome in England. So in 1717, when the Premier Grand Lodge was set up, lodges that had Scots or Irish immigrant members were shunned by the Premier Grand Lodge. So this led to there being two streams of Freemasonry, one for the Hanoverian Protestants and the other for Jacobite Catholics. Uh, many people have suggested that this div division was between Whigs and Tories, the two main political parties, but I believe it's more than this. The, the Jacobites were supported, sorry, supporters of the exiled King James II, who was a Catholic, and uh, they wanted him to take the throne from the Protestant King George of Hanover. There had been many attempts to take the throne by force by the Jacobites, uh, 1689, 1708, and the last in 1716, just before the establishment of the Grand Lodge. But again, after the establishment, again in 1719 and 1745, there were still attempts by Jacobites to take the throne of England. So the St. John's Lodges, the Premier Grand Lodge was uh, established in 1717. 30 years later, the St. John's Lodges decided to establish their own Grand Lodge, which they called the Grand Lodge of the Ancients. Uh, they chose this name to infer that their ritual was older or more ancient compared to that of the Premier Grand Lodge, which was then called uh, the Moderns. The interesting thing about the Moderns, the Premier Grand Lodge, is that they actually rewrote the operative ritual, uh, the operative Mason's rituals. And as I've shown elsewhere, they incorporated alchemical and I believe Chinese Taoist lessons. The ancients on the other hand, started to develop various degrees. And one of the problems they had is they could not agree which was superior, the Scottish Mark Master degree or the Irish Royal Arch degree. And they went on to invent and expand uh, several new degrees. And some of these new degrees were then uh, exported to France with the development of Jacobite lodges in France. And this became part of the Scottish Rite and traveled to the USA during the American War of Independence. Uh, what in England we call the American Revolutionary War. And eventually they formed their own organization, the Grand Chapter in America uh, in 1798. This later joined with other similar organizations uh, such as Cryptic Masons. And this is now often been known as the American Rite. So in 1813, when the two Grand Lodges uh, combined the ancients and the moderns. This resulted in this new abbreviation, the AF and the AM, Ancient Free and Accepted Masons. <clears throat> and here I want to just bring in uh, some visuals. Uh, where do I bring in the visuals? Here we go. Share screen. Here we go. Share, share. Okay. <clears throat> There we go. Yes. <laughs> so this is the um, the union, uh, the act of union, and uh, the, the signature of um, uh, the Duke of, uh, of Kent, Edward, Grand Master, and Augustus Frederick, Grand Master, Duke of Sussex. And so when the the amalgamated United Grand Lodge of England's 
first started in 1813, the, surprisingly, the Grand Master that was chosen was actually the younger brother, Duke of Sussex. And I believe it's because the Duke of Kent actually wasn't very interested in Freemasonry. Okay, so let's continue like this. <clears throat> um, so uh, after the union of the two Grand Lodges, then the Royal Arch degree, which had been uh, used by the ancients, became accepted as a kind of fourth degree. One of the problems was that in the Grand Lodge of the Ancients, and I think we can change this now. Um, ah, this is to show you that Grand Lodge of Massachusetts is AF and AM, whereas the Grand Lodge of Vermont is only F and AM. This small difference shows that um, it was established before the Union, uh, when the Ancients were uh, accepted as part of the United. But the only strange thing about this is that the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts claims a date of 1733, so it should actually be F and A. Anyway, so um, I mentioned the two, the, the relationship between the two Grand Masters and the Grand Master of the Ancients, who then decided uh, to step down from Freemasonry and the Duke of Sussex became the Grand Master of the United Grand Lodge of England. One of the problems they had uh, was, uh, and then this is the, uh, this is Grand Lodge of Massachusetts and Grand Lodge of Vermont, just for examples, but the difference between F and AM and A, F and AM. Um, I'm not sure of the reason for the Massachusetts inclusion. So then, what the problem was that um, the in the Grand Lodge of the Ancients, the Royal Arch, uh, only past masters could take this degree. And so what they did is they found a way around it. And they introduced a, a virtual degree called the past master's degree, which uh, was anybody could uh, take if you're a master mason but it didn't make you a past master. <clears throat> and we can see this, this is a past master's apron with the three, towel level, uh, three towels on it. And if you bend the apron, you get the sign of the triple towel. And it's a kind of hidden sign in the past master's apron. So anyway, this is the background uh, to the situation 1813. So now let's look at the Royal Arch degree. Um, one of the reasons I was interested in this, and actually I wrote a book about the Royal Arch, is that the Royal Arch is part of the Blue Lodge as a chapter, but it's also the first degree of both Scottish Rite and York Rite. And I was interested to see why this was important. And the history, uh, well, we understand that there was a parade in Ireland at Yorgo in 1743. So that makes it nearly 20 years after the start of the first, uh, after the Premier Grand Lodge. However, in an article in a magazine in 1725, uh, there was an indirect reference to a degree, wasn't called the Royal Arch, but it's, the content was the same. And this is the same year as the third degree was in, uh, introduced by the Premier Grand Lodge. So many people saw the Royal Arch as a culmination of the third degree. And it became very popular in London. And I believe the, the Grand Lodge of the Ancients used this degree as the claim, their claim to fame. Um, previously, uh, Blue Lodge in the Grand, uh, Premier Grand Lodge had been a two degree ritual. And this, these two degrees were rewritten by the first three Grand Masters. And then in 1725, they added the third degree. Of course, then there was a lot of interest in that third degree. And I believe the ancients didn't want to get left out in attracting members to their ritual. So they either embellished or um, uh, completely wrote uh, from the beginning um, this Royal Arch degree. Anyway, it made the ancients very popular. 
what I found was interesting. There are actually three versions of Royal Arch and uh, they differ in very many aspects. First of all, there is no agreement on who the first three officers are. So you can see in this picture, I don't know if you follow my mouse, but the officers are labeled and they're actually got different names. <clears throat> um, secondly, as you can see, the layouts are different. The one in the middle is the English Aldersgate ritual. Uh, the one on the right is Duncan's, which is based on a web ritual. And the one on the left is a commonly used um, American ritual. I think uh, Scottish right. Uh, the Masters of the Veils, but here we have RAC. Here we don't have any veils. Here we actually have four veils. So uh, everything's slightly different. <clears throat> And uh, if we go to the next page, <clears throat> uh, then uh, there's the story about the keystone. And this is taken from Lawrence Dermot. Uh, he was the secretary of the Grand Lodge of the Ancients, and he promoted Royal Arch as it was popular. And you can see the keystone being taken out. Uh, <clears throat> so this is actually. Um, uh, interesting to think about because if you take a keystone out of an arch and in the ritual it says key, uh, the stone was removed to give Stolkin access to the vault and so this is very stupid uh, probably dangerous as well because the the arch would collapse and this picture is actually slightly incorrect because the above the arch is all earth because when the, they were clearing the rubble of King Solomon's temple, it was all covered in earth. He found a trap door and then it became this and he took it out. The whole thing would collapse, the earth would fall in and the vault would be, would never be found. So it's a slightly strange thing. Secondly, the keystone, um, you can judge by the height, you know, probably uh, if this is 10 foot tall, then this has got to be at least two foot, two foot or three foot uh, in size. Well, uh, stone weighs about 175 pounds per cubic foot. <clears throat> this is really quite heavy, that's 80 kilograms. And, you know, we pass it around in the lodge, but I think it, in reality, it would be impossible for people to manhandle the, the key stuff. This is the picture from um, Duncan, and it shows uh, Stolkin being lowered through a trapdoor uh, in, in the ground. They've taken the trapdoor out and they're lowering him, and then he finds the keystone. So you can see all the earth and the rubble of King Solomon's temple. Um, so nowadays in lodges, uh, this, in the old days, um, in the old days, talking about the 1700s, 1800s, they would put a trapdoor in the ceiling and lower somebody uh, into the lodge to represent the vault. Uh, of course, now that can't be done. And so um, uh, other ideas have been incorporated to, to kind of visualize this trapdoor. A third thing to think about is why the degree is called the Holy Royal Arch because in the constitutions of the Grand Lodge of England, uh, it is now called the Supreme uh, Order of the Royal Arch. And in 1778, it was actually called the Sublime Degree. So it went from sublime to supreme to holy. <clears throat> uh, thinking about this, I'm not quite sure. I feel it's because uh, going back to the history that <clears throat> and this goes back to the Act of Uniformity, where there was prejudice against uh, Catholics, particularly Scots and Irish in, in England. And so most of the members of the Grand Lodge of the Ancients were Catholic, whereas the, the other Premier Grand Lodge was Protestant. And so as they were Catholic, they wanted to make it uh, the degree special to their Grand Lodge. And... Um, Albert Pike, <clears throat> the um, Masonic historian, he believes that um, in, in uh, Israel, 
there was an original lodge where the Almighty had revealed himself to the Israelites. And he felt that the Royal Arch was a representation of that uh, lodge. And that is the reason it was called holy. So uh, lastly, we need to look at uh, the degree in terms of esoteric teachings. Um, I ref in my book, I refer to Trinitarianism, Trinitarianism uh, because um, <clears throat> in the time of the uh, Enlightenment, which is the period we're talking about, uh, people were re-evaluating um, certain philosophies and dogma, particularly religious dogma. And uh, in England, we don't talk about the Trinity. The Trinity is more of a Catholic theory um, where three persons can act in the... Oh, 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 suddenly went dark. Three persons uh, acting together to... Uh, sorry. There we go. Um, uh, to so the, the three persons of the Trinity, they were questioning whether the three persons act together when they did something. So, for example, the stories in the in the Bible was the um, uh, God and the Holy Spirit did they act in accord, or did um, one have uh, a higher rank than the other or you know how they work together this is quite an important point in those days and what we see in this picture is exactly this sort of situation you have the three people working together to bring something of great value out of the depths and this is the same story that is given in the gospel of thomas and in fact I believe it's a spiritual exercise which is actually being carried out uh, in the Royal Arch Lodge. Um, I talk about more about this in my, my book, but uh, there is actually more to the Royal Arch because uh, there is also a Rosicrucian connection to the Royal Arch. And the original story can actually be traced back to the fourth century. And uh, so, <clears throat> I talk about this in my book in more, more detail, but uh, I think it'd be an interesting thing for people to research. So in, in summary, I believe that the ancients, they rewrote an Irish ceremony, which they included in their rituals and called it the Royal Arch. And this way uh, they gave the, the Grand Lodge of the ancients, both a, a certain distinction and a certain authority. <coughs> uh, that kind of summarizes where I've got to. Um, if you have any questions, please. <laughs> yeah. Excellent, as always, my brother Chris. I do have a, a quick uh, just a comment here, because um, I have been researching about like Ireland and the like the, the Celtic pantheon, uh, Tuatha de Danann. Uh, I did notice that Brigitte, uh, she is a, also a triple deity. Um, you see this common theme in the Celtic pantheon. Uh, do you think there's a connection there? Uh, you know, when these uh, pagan uh, religions got absorbed, do uh, you think there's a connection there? It's quite possible because the Catholics are, are known for taking over uh, pagan uh, sites, particularly what they call power spots, where the pagans had temples and then they would put a Catholic temple or cathedral on that spot. Um, so yes, it's, it's quite possible. However, at this time in the 1700s and 16, late 1600s, uh, Catholicism uh, was deeply rooted in uh, Ireland since something like the fifth century AD. So um, I don't think that they believed in paganism, but they certainly believed in the Catholic church. So, so is it safe to say that um, the Royal Arch is uh, sort of like an emulation from early Irish uh, degrees or? Yes, so uh, the, uh, the procession that was held in Yorgal in Ireland in 1743, which is the only 
uh, description of the royal arch being actually acted out, um, this could have been a religious or a religious uh, uh, procession because in re religious processions, um, carrying an arch um, was nothing unusual. You know, you'd have two deacons either side with the priest in, in between and they make an arch of flowers or something over his head. So, um, and also uh, King uh, Jesus was seen as being uh, uh, the offshoot of King David so that Jesus himself was a member of a royal family. So Jesus was often seen as being royal himself. So uh, in Ireland, they could have taken it that, you know, that they were representing the royal family or the, the um, nobility of Jesus in their ritual, in their walk, in the <clears throat> in the procession, carrying an arch, it's not you know, and it's it's quite possible that this was then introduced and and developed upon by the ancients for their degree. So, uh, any other questions uh, from the brethren here for Brother Why Chris? All right, all right, all right. Can, you can see me, right? Yeah, I can see you fine. All right, here's the the brethren here. Say hi. To okay. Chris. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, one of the things that's interesting I found is um, Jonathan Swift. Uh, Jonathan Swift wrote uh, uh, about being in London in, uh, he was actually in London in 1723 uh, to 1725, just as the third degree and the Royal Arch were being kind of released into society. And he wrote about it, and he talked about there being four um, pairs of passwords to be used uh, in the ritual. Well, Freemason, he doesn't have four pairs of, of uh, passwords. Only in the Royal Arch, each, um, uh, each veil, uh, we would have a password, and then we would have a reply or a counter, a counter password, and there were four so I think he's referring to the Royal Arch, and that's um, he wrote that in 1723. So that's it's quite interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Chris. Uh, I welcome. wish you I wish you uh, the the best uh, with your future books that you're uh, working on. I know you're always busy. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I love you, brother. Uh, stay safe out there in Japan. I, I, I wish you the best, and uh, we'll talk soon. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Let us know what the winning uh, lottery numbers are today over here. <laughs> over here. <laughs> Time difference, yes, that, yeah. that would work. <laughs> Take it easy, brother Chris. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for watching. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Until next time, to be one, ask one.